So I don't know if you've ever noticed how easy it is to be judgmental. If you're not very good at it, I'm going to give you a little lesson so you can be better at being judgmental. The first thing that you need to be able to do is you need to be able to see the problems with other people. The way to do that is to simply compare them to you. Whatever you do is right. Okay, so your type of haircut, the way that you walk, the team that you root for, the school that you go to, the way that you spend your money and the way that you parent your kids, that's the right way. First, you need to look down on those people. Then what you need to do is you need to purse your lips a little like this. And you do this. And then you've got it. Okay, give it a try. Green Campus, you too. South Umquad, you got it. That's good. You just little of that and shake the head. Uh, I, I noticed this, that whatever you do is the right way. So this is especially true financially. That whatever you spend is a wise decision. You are frugal. If people spend less than you, they're tightwads. You, you spend the right amount. People that spend more are frivolous and wasteful. You. You are the right way. I saw this at Walmart. I went in uh, at 1130 p.m. I'm coming back into ten town. Had to pick up some stuff for the medical stuff. And so we're getting some medicine. And while I'm in there, there was a family that was there with their two-year-old. It's 1130 at night. And I was commenting on this. I was judging them, obviously, for the right reasons, because I would never have my kids there at 1130. And I was talking to a friend. He said, oh, I've had my two-year-old there at 1130. We just got out of the ER. Just got a little awkward, because I was judging, not knowing the whole story. Uh, interestingly enough, um, if you really want to be judged, simply take a picture from your senior year in high school and show it to your kids. <laughs> they will laugh their heads off who cuts their hair and does that well you see 22 years ago the world was a different place and some of you are thinking your kids would go dad you had hair yeah, yeah. it was not true anymore well what happens when we are looking at someone and the temptation is to judge because what they're doing is actually sin so we could joke about the way people spend their money and dress and the way they walk and what school they went to and what, what team they root for and that's all fun and games but when someone's sinning, there's a problem. They're doing something that's wrong. So as a follower of Jesus, isn't my responsibility to help out? And to help out, don't I have to point it out? How do I handle sin in other people? Now specifically today, we're going to look at not only handling sin in others, but what happens when an entire society is headed in the wrong direction? Because that's what Paul's going to lean into. Paul is one of our key characters. I want to catch you up on just some key characters for this story. It's all, don't you hate when you go someplace and they start talking about people and you're like, I have no idea who these people are. We like to give you a little background. Key characters for today. The Apostle Paul, he's one of the main leaders of the church in this first early part of the church. He's the Apostle Paul, not Pastor Paul. Pastor Paul is the campus pastor here at this campus. The Apostle Paul died about 2,000 years ago, which is just before the Pastor Paul was born. Just, they were really almost together on that. Then we have the Epicureans. The Epicureans were a group of people that were philosophers in Greece, and they believed the highest aim was to simply be happy. Okay? On the other side were the Stoics. They were actually polar opposite. Both of them philosophers. The Stoics believed the goal in life was to, so that you didn't feel pain. It's to not care about anything. Basically suppress all emotions. So you have Stoics on one side and Epicureans on the other. My observation is if you're going to have someone build your house, have a Stoic build it. If you're going to have a party, invite an Epicurean. They're going to be more fun. So as we look at this, these people are going to come into play. Give you a little background on where we are um, uh, just in the story across the globe. We're here in Douglas County, Oregon, the three campuses. I want you to see how far we are, are going across the world. If you have the United States, we're not only traveling across the world to have this dialogue, but we're also transitioning from 2018 to about 2,000 years ago, past Spain, past Italy. Last week we were in Greece in Berea, which is a small town. This is where uh, we learned a lot about the importance of Scripture. After they... Um, the conversation in Berea, we have the Apostle Paul leaves Berea and heads south to what's currently the capital of Greece, to Athens. Now, he gets there ahead of everyone else. Timothy and Silas stay in Berea for a little bit longer, and Paul's essentially waiting for them. But in the process of the waiting, we're going to have today's story. Timeline-wise, if we look at the, the Bible, uh, the Bible breaks down into two segments. We have the Old Testament and the New Testament. And it's good to know where things lay out. Abraham, Moses, and David are key characters, but they're in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it's only actually 100 years long, a little less than that. And Paul went on three missionary journeys. And we're going to be in the middle one. So we're going to be in about 51 AD. And he's in Athens. And at this point, he's essentially by himself. 
So as we pick this up, I want you, if you have the paperback version of the Bible, I want a pen ready, because we've got a couple things that we want you to underline and to circle and to be aware of. So here we have it. Paul was waiting for them. Remember, that's Timothy and Silas. He's in Athens, and he's waiting. Now, what happens a lot of the times is whenever we're in the waiting room stage of life, whether or not it's at the doctor's office, the dentist's office, the vet's office, but when we're in the waiting room, usually what we do is we know exactly how to spend our time. We simply catch up on all that's going on. My observation with Paul is while he is waiting, he is also ready. So if you're in a season of life where you are waiting for the next thing to start, you don't know what's next. You don't know what college you're going to go to. You don't know what direction you want your life to go. When you're in the waiting room, it still matters. Watch what Paul does. He was greatly distressed to see the, uh, that the city was full of idols. He sees the direction of an entire society. A great way to say this. In fact, if you have this right off to the side, heartbroken. This is a pressure upon him. He sees it and he says, something is desperately wrong in Athens. They're full of idols, which is a, basically a statue of some sort of god. They, uh, they were uh, pantheists who believed in all sorts of, of gods. So he reasoned in the synagogue, that's a Jewish meeting place, both with Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. Now watch this. A group of Epicureans and Stoics, remember these two are polar opposites, but they're philosophers, started to argue with Paul. They began to debate with him. And some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? And others remarked, he seems to be advocating for some foreign gods. Uh, they said because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Because the simple story is this, that everyone in the world is a sinner. And because we are sinners, we are separated from God. And because we are separated from God, we need him to transform our lives. And the only way to do that is to put our faith into Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God, who left heaven, came and lived a perfect life, something none of us could do. He then died on the cross and rose from the dead. This is exactly the opposite of the way the Epicureans and the Stoics believed. And so as they see this, they say, there is no way this guy is talking gibberish. Well, if you look at their society, they really functioned in this philosophic format. Most of them spent most of their time, it actually says in 20, they spent most of their time just talking. All of the Athenians and foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. They love to hear, no, no, there's a new idea, let's hear about it. And so because of this, they bring Paul in to, the, uh, to their central meeting area, uh, the Areopagus, to talk with them. And he shares the good news of Jesus Christ. And listen to this. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Are, um, Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. Now remember, what's going on emotionally for Paul when he sees Athens? He sees the idols. He sees the worship of other gods. He sees the direction of a society. What was he feeling? Heartbreak, distress, tension. But look at how he responds. And this is where we're going to find a lot of our challenge today. As I walked around, I looked carefully at your objects of worship. What was breaking his heart? Where was the distress? At their objects of worship. But notice how he responds. Because typically when I'm distressed about something, I'm going to come in either fearful or angry. But watch how he does this. I even found an altar with an inscription to an unknown God. He takes this little idea that they have of all the idols. They were afraid that they had missed one of the gods. So they had one that's the unknown God. The one we haven't heard of yet. Let's just make sure we don't offend him. And they made an idol to him too. Paul sees this and says, ah, I've got you. And he says, I'm going to tell you who that unknown God is. The one you haven't heard of, he's actually the one that made the whole world. He's the one that loves you. He's the one that is calling you home. He has been very gracious with how you have been living. But he loves you and he's calling you home. You are ignorant of the very thing that you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. I'm going to tell you about the goodness of Jesus Christ. So my, my first question for you, and this is on your outline, is how do you respond when you see people's sins? And specifically, I want to lean into... What I would say is the distress that's in the room, the distress that's in the county, the distress that's in the state and in our country. When you see a society heading off the cliff, how do you feel? Stop and think for a second. I want you to think about the way the world was when you were growing up. Would you say that society is better or worse? And some of you feel the tension of that. And you're heartbroken and you're watching and you're seeing the way people act and you're seeing the direction. I heard a description. I think this fits pretty well. It's like watching a drunk guy chase a balloon next to a cliff. It's not going to end well. You feel that tension. And typically the way that tension comes out, the distress Paul felt, 
See, now you're with me. We're 2,000 years ago we're talking about this, but you feel this tension too. You look at society and say, something's wrong. And usually we respond with two answers, fear and anger. And I want to talk through how was it that Paul handled this. When it comes to the idea of the fear, this is usually what you want to do whenever there's fear involved. You want to run away from it. So Paul lands in Athens. Timothy and Silas aren't there yet. He looks around and sees a society that is not headed in the right direction. You know what he could have done? Get on the next boat to not Athens. Just go somewhere else. Typically the way I notice this working just in life is whenever you see a society that you don't like, you leave the city and try to go to a smaller town. But if you leave Portland to find a smaller town, what you'll find is another society that's headed off the cliff. So you've got to find a smaller town and a smaller town, and finally you live off in the woods by yourself. Okay? If you take fear far enough, this is where it leads you. When you say address change, I can't stay here, I want you to put the word fear next to that. Fear. F-E-A-R. Society's collapsing. We've got to do something. I don't know what, so I'll just get out of here. The second one is probably more common, and maybe more common in the United States, partly because of our background. But typically, the way I see many respond is to look for regime change. If we simply change out who's in control, we will change society. But I wanted you to know something, that if you could pick any country in any time in history and decide that you got to pick every leader at every position across that entire thing, here's what you would do. You would control it for a moment, but you would not change the human heart. And regime change is not the same as heart change. Now listen carefully to how the New Testament is laid out. The first four books are about the life of Jesus Christ. The next book is about the story of the church. After that, there are just a number of letters written from church leaders to other people. And in response to all of those, there are three main characters. There's Jesus Christ, who is in the first four books. Then you have the Apostle Paul, who we're talking about today. And you have a guy named Peter. Peter's probably the most famous of Jesus' disciples because he always had his foot in his mouth. What I find interesting about all three of these characters in all of the New Testament, each one of them came up against a society that was totally headed off a cliff. And in each instance, not one of them attempted or spoke to having political change. At no point did they try to remove the emperor. At no point did they try to remove Pilate. In fact, here's an interesting little thing. The church, it's not really the church, the Jewish people at the time were waiting for a savior, a Messiah to come and save Israel. What they expected was a political savior. They expected someone to come and free them from Rome. Jesus did not come as a political savior. He came as a spiritual savior. And there's this great moment. The leader of Israel at the time was a guy named Pilate. Pilate had in his hands the ability to, to decide if Jesus would be executed or not. And they have a little dialogue. And Pilate says, don't you realize I have the authority of whether or not you're going to live or die? And Jesus says, you only have the authority that God gave you. No, you don't. Not really. In fact, I I always pictured this way, that Jesus said, I don't want your job. I've got a better one. And then Jesus died on the cross. Paul, in in uh, a letter to the Romans, in fact, says, whoever your authority is, submit to them. Peter said it more strongly than either of the other two. When Peter wrote a letter to the church, he said these critical words, fear God and honor the emperor. Honor who's in charge of you. Now, here's what's so difficult about that. The emperor at the time was Nero. Nero was one of the most sadistic, evil men I've ever studied in history. I would put him above Hitler, right there with Stalin, in all of history. He used to take Christians, dip them in boiling oil, then light them on fire and use them as candles for his orgies. That's how he treated Christians. And what was Peter's response? Fear God and honor the emperor. Now here's what, when when society, and we feel it, all of us in the room feel it, it's not what it was. When we decide we're going to try and change it simply on a political level, you'll never move to the the proper level, which is the spiritual level. I'm not saying don't vote. Man, choose wisely who's going to be in charge. You have a voice. Not all places do. Use that wisely. But at the same time, realize you will never make the real change, what Paul goes after, the heart change. He didn't talk about changing the leadership of Athens. He talked about changing the heart inside each of them. Oh, how powerful this is. And I would give this little caveat too. If you spend your time attempting to change things politically, you often lose your voice to change things spiritually. Because when you argue about how you will govern, 
it's very difficult to discuss what's going on and what's breaking your heart because you sent people in opposition to each other. And you may be opposed to what they believe, but at the same time, you're going to miss the real chance that what they need is Jesus. What we need is Jesus. What the society needs is Jesus. In fact, if you want to change the world, lead your neighbor to Jesus Christ. That's, that is voting versus leading your neighbor to, to Christ. You, you can't compare the two. It's the bottom part of that because heart change is the key to this. Now, interestingly enough, when you do this, you're going to have to be able to connect with them. And I'm so fascinated at the way that Paul does this. He connects with their culture. Now, when I look at this, I say I have a problem. I don't connect well with cultures that aren't my own. And one of the things that's happened for me is that as Jason's been on the staff in Green, he has really helped me see from a broader perspective how can I look at the church and how can I look at the society and connect with them. You, in the process here, oh wait, you got to do this. Say hi to the other campuses. Isn't that the coolest thing? You just spoke across the county. In your ministry, what is it that you've been doing and seeing on how do you connect with them in a way that isn't natural? that I run at the Green Campus. Uh, to be frank, it was super weird, guys. I am an awkward guy by nature. Like, you get to know me, I'm awkward. We actually have a, uh, a catchphrase at the Green Campus, embrace the awkward because of this guy, okay? So we began out, I'm a young leader, I'm trying to figure out how to lead kids to Jesus, and we have five other leaders in the ministry with us, and four kids. <laughs> Four kids on a good night. Mm -hmm. Two kids on a regular night. They were brother and sister. So um, it was a struggle, right? But as the ministry has grown, and we went from two kids on a regular night to 25 to 35 kids, God has really blessed it. What I've noticed is back in the day, I attracted kids just like me. Awkward. Introverts. Like, we got together, and it was like, I don't know how to talk to you, so we're just going to stand close to each other. <laughs> but as the ministry has grown, we're attracting people that are totally different from me. Right? Case in point, last month, kid named Javante, he's awesome. Six foot tall, muscular dude, plays football, right? He's got swagger when he talks. He could beat me up. He could definitely beat Will up. Um, but You're not saying much there. That's like, yeah. you're not going on a limb there. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. But Javante loves sports. And I don't know if you can tell by looking at me, I don't sport, guys. Like, at all. In fact, last year for the Super Bowl, my wife made me a shirt that said, I don't football, okay? So, like, that's where I'm at. This, I is, think this is more true than you actually know, yeah. and we have visual evidence. We want to make sure that you're fully aware of, of what this guy uh, is like. Watch this. As <laughs> my best effort. Here's my favorite part right here. You're cheering, thinking that you had done something right. I just thought you had to get it close. So. No, <laughs> it's not a hand grenade. It's a ball. <laughs> so... So um, I don't sport, and Javante, in the first conversation with him, I was talking with him, and it was like we were speaking different languages. He's talking about his last game, and they won by this many points, and there was this field goal, and he's the tight end. And I'm like, uh-huh, yep, just nod and smile. I have no clue what this kid is talking about, right? And like the whole conversation, I'm just thinking, I feel like we're speaking different languages. And I realized in order to reach somebody I had never reached before, I'd have to do something I'd never done before. So I went to the source of all misinformation, Wikipedia. <laughs> and I researched football. And I started, because I heard him say tight end, I thought he said tide end, like tide pools. <laughs> Apparently it's tight. It's tight. So, like my pants are tight. So, yeah. So tight end. Tight end. And apparently it's an offensive position. It, it's actually not offensive. They, they don't, they're not out there cussing. It's offense. They're <laughs> offense. They're, try they're trying to score points. Okay. So we're two services in, and I'm still trying to process this. But I was wondering, like, <laughs> what is this guy's job? He's up there on the line just like, your mom is so weird, guys. I'm like, why is this guy so offensive, yeah. you know? But, um, <laughs> yeah, but I realized in order to reach someone I had never reached before, um, I'd have to do something I'd never done before. I had to know their culture. And if you want to reach people who are different from you, you're going to have to know their culture. And it's so interesting, Paul doesn't just use this unknown God, right, to speak of Jesus. He goes on in verse 28, he does something interesting here. He says, for in him we live, we move, and we have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. The interesting thing here is this is not scripture. Uh, in the moment, Paul is not quoting scripture. He's actually quoting from a Greek philosopher. 
named Epimenides. And there was this growing movement in Greek culture that uh, one of their gods, Zeus, had died, right? And so Epimenides, he was a follower of Zeus. He was a pantheist, believed in multiple gods. And he decided, he wrote a poem in defense of Zeus's life. And this was the closing line. For in him we live, we move, we have our being. And Paul knows this. He knew their culture. And he sees a hint of truth there. Yeah, in Jesus. Time out, time out, time out. You're telling me that this line that he's quoting in yeah. front of them is quoting their current hip-hop guy? Yeah, exactly. Th- he's, this is not about Jesus. Right. He's flipping the script on them. Yeah, he's taking something in their culture that he sees truth in and using it to share Christ with them. And I thought, like, what would the modern-day Epimenides be? Like, what would that be today? And there's this band that's kind of blown up in the last three or four years called 21 Pilots. My son loves them. Um, And really, if you listen to the lyrics of their songs, the heart's cry is the gospel. In fact, they actually have a, a song called Heavy, Dirty Soul. And the chorus says, Can you save my heavy, dirty soul for me? Now, is that not a perfect bridge from the culture to the gospel. That is awesome. Yeah. You've also said, as we've been talking about this idea of connection with, with culture and how do you see people, who they are and how they are, and connect with them where they are, you said that this has been happening in your home too, that this isn't just an out there. Yeah, person. so um, I have three kids. Uh, they are awesome. Emberlyn, six years old. Aud- uh, Asher is four years old, and then Audra's three years old. And Emberlyn is basically Hang on, me. you had three kids in how many years? Yeah, we were busy, and uh, we're done. So let's <laughs> just put that out there. We are done. No more <laughs> kids. Um, but Emberlyn is basically me and a six-year-old girl, right? Like, remove the beard, elongate the hair, boom, it's me. Same personality, analytical, super emotional, all right? My other two kids are very different from me, especially my youngest, Audra. She's uh, super artistic, and she loves puzzles. And if there's one thing that is the bane of my existence, it is puzzles. Puzzles and football are right there? Yeah, they're like like equal. I I just don't get it. It's like I'm putting together someone else's artwork. Anyways, okay, that's a totally other point. But um, Audra is so different for me. And in fact, um, where I always know why I'm feeling what I'm feeling, she doesn't, when she has big emotions, she doesn't always understand where they came from. And so it takes her some time to process. So we're very different. And over the last year, I've noticed um, we have a lot of great family time together, but I've noticed even in that, there's been a divide between me and her. And I realized in order to reach her in a greater way, I'd have to change what I've done. And we have a lot of great time together as a family, but I don't have a lot of alone time with my kids. And so we have this thing now called daddy time. And in daddy time, kids get to do whatever they want. No screens, that's the one rule, no screens, but we do whatever they want. And uh, what do you think Audra chooses? Football. No. <laughs> puzzles, ah, right? One out of two. The same for Doc's, Doc McStuffins puzzles every day, right? But it's amazing that as we put these puzzles together, it's not just about making someone else's artwork. I've had a, an avenue through which I can speak into her life. I can love her in a greater way. I can share Christ with her. And you know, it's funny. Yesterday, um, we did our daddy time. And she is, she's kind of a three-nager, so, you know, like a three-year-old teenager. She's like, Daddy, and she's got some sass, you know, Daddy, you are like my BFF, <laughs> and you're my greatest friend, and I promise I will try and stay three years old as long as I can. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, but we're sharing life together, and, it's, and she's opening up to me. She's sharing about our relationship and how she feels about it, and uh, it's been an amazing process. It's, think of that, that. You were saying that you felt a divide, and mm-hmm. by connecting with her culture, yeah. you're pulling it back in. See, it's not even just outside her home. It's also inside. But here's the interesting thing. Everything you're talking about is great just EQ. It's great just how to win friends and influence people. Yeah. What's the difference between just making yourself popular and transformation? Yeah, in fact, that's a basic social skill, right? Connecting with people, um, learning how to build relationships. But um, you can connect with culture all you want. But if you don't have the gospel, you don't have anything. And Paul, uh, he does just that. He uses their culture to bridge the gap. And first, the culture or the gospel needs to go inward before it can go outward. Paul is a perfect example of this. Um, he doesn't have a glowing history. <laughs> he was a religious Jewish man who hated Christians, who hated Christ. He persecuted the church. He oversaw executions. He partook in them. 
And he has this radical, transforming moment with God. And now here he is, sharing Christ with Greeks. Before, Jewish man wouldn't even go into a building with a Gentile. Now he's in their culture, sharing Christ. And so the question I'm asking is, am I being changed by the gospel? Is there a change happening in your life? And Paul, he closes this conversation with this group of people with, these, with the very thing that he knows so well, the transforming power of God. Look at this in verse 30. He says, In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. If you have a physical Bible, just underline that word, repent. That's a transformative word. It literally means a changing of mind. And you know, Paul, he shares the gospel, and the room is quickly divided. Right? Because when he speaks of the resurrection, part of his audience was the Stoics. The Stoics believed that the body was evil. The spirit's the only thing that really matters. And so why would there be a resurrection? Like that doesn't make sense. Why would God resurrect something that's evil? And so when they heard this, when they heard the gospel, the simple gospel, that we are sinners by nature and choice, that we are in need of a Savior, that he died on a cross to pay the debt that our sin has uh, gained, and that three days later he rose again. When they heard the resurrection, they mock him. But look at this in verse 34. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysus, a member of the Areopagus, and a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. Some of them became. Underline that word became. That's another transformative word. They were not, and they became. Their lives were changed. I want to show you a a picture of myself circa 2006. <laughs> hang on, hang on. It says uh, arrest.org. Is, yeah. This is not a selfie? No, it's not a selfie. That was a police officer that took that one. You notice I have the same amount of hair. It's just in a different spot now. <laughs> um, but this is me in 2006. My, my story with Jesus did not begin in a church. It did not begin in a Bible study or in a prayer group. Uh, my story with Jesus began with two lawyers and a judge. Uh, in 2006, for right before this picture, for the previous six years, um, I had a hidden addiction to prescription drugs and marijuana. From the moment I woke up to the moment I went to sleep, that's all I pursued with all my heart. And on March 13th, 2006, that all came to a head. And this hiddenness that I had in my life came out into the open for everyone to see. Um, and I remember going to the jail um, my parents came to pick up my car, and I looked at their faces. I just saw pure grief. And I sat in the jail for seven days. And uh, on the seventh day, they brought me before Judge Ambrosini. And he gave me two options. He said, you can do the time for your crime, or because this is your first felony, you can do a diversion program. And in, I chose the diversion program, and, and the requirements of the program were stringent. I had to go um, to court every Monday. I had to go before the judge. And he would basically decide whether or not I was free for the week based on my performance, whether I followed the rules of my probation officer, whether I took the UAs that they asked, uh, did group therapy, did individual therapy. There was a lot going on in this program. But that wasn't the worst part of this time for me. The most difficult part was I had lost trust in every relationship that I had. I had hid this from my family, and I had hurt them for years. And now it was out in the open, and they couldn't trust me. And my friends left me because I didn't have what they wanted anymore. They were still in addictions, and, and I wasn't doing that life anymore. And uh, in fact, uh, because of the diversion program, they actually moved me to a homeless shelter called Casa de Belen. It's a teen homeless shelter. And... Uh, Nothing to do with my parents. It was just they wanted to completely remove me from the life I had lived. And I remember one night as I'm sitting there um, in the shelter, and the rooms, the guy's wing was conjoined by a bathroom. So two rooms conjoined by a bathroom. And on the other side of the bathroom, uh, there was uh, my bathroom mate, Mike. He was sobbing. And I could hear him. And so I went over there, I knocked on the door, and I said, Mike, are you okay? And he said, no. And so I went in, I went in to console him, right? And he began to share the cycle of defeat he felt. And that just this 
overwhelming feeling of shame and guilt and grief. And while I went over there to help him, I realized in that moment, I, I don't have the words of life. Like, I don't know the answer to what you're seeking. And so I went back to my room, super emotional guy here, and I began to weep. God, I just started my life out. And I've already ruined it. And I sat there on my knees on the floor, and something came to mind. Between the ages of seven and ten, I can't remember very well, I remembered something. My uncle, Sean, he's a follower of Jesus. And uh, one morning he was taking me to church, and on our way to church, I remember asking him this question, how do you get to heaven? I had some vague notions about what heaven was and who God is, and so I asked him, and he took the time, he pulled off the freeway, we were going to be late to church, but that didn't matter, he wanted to focus in, and he shared the simple gospel with me, that I am a sinner by nature and by choice, in need of a Savior, that Jesus came, he lived a perfect life, the life I'm supposed to live, he died on a cross to pay the penalty for my sin, and that three days later he rose again, and that is my hope for a new life. And those words, as I sat there on the floor in my room at the shelter, new life, just rang out in my head. I need that, new life. And so I prayed the first prayer I can ever remember praying. God, I don't know who you are, but I want to spend the rest of my life finding out. And I am grateful to say that I am no longer this man. You know what's interesting? Hmm. I'm around you a lot. Yeah. I don't recognize that smirk. Yeah, this is, uh, I thought I knew better than the police officers. I was arguing law with them right before this shot. Um, but God has really humbled me. And I'm no longer this man. In fact, I have 13 years clean today. Yeah. And God has truly blessed me. Uh, this is my family, my awesome wife, Shaughnessy, on the left. Um, she has taught me so much about grace and forgiveness. Um, she's one of my biggest supporters. Um, and then these are my three kids, uh, Asher, Emberlyn, and Audra, and they are awesome. This is the busy stage? Yeah, this is, so, yeah, our life is busy. <laughs> yeah. But um, while those pictures are back to back, I don't want to be mistaken, it was not a overnight transformation. There was over a decade of me taking a step towards Jesus and him slowly transforming, and it was painful. You see, addiction causes a lot of brokenness in relationships, and I had to go back to those relationships, and I had to make amends, mm -hmm. and there was a lot of difficult conversations, mm -hmm. um, but God was faithful and restored me and restored those relationships, and he's given me a beautiful family. Um, and so what I want you to hear, maybe you're here today and you hear this, this, uh, this question we're asking, am I being changed by the gospel? And you know in your heart there is something God is telling you this needs to change. And maybe it feels overwhelming, maybe it feels impossible. Maybe it's not drug addiction, maybe it's something that just you struggle with. I hope you hear in my story that there is nothing too heavy or too far gone for God to change. And while in the meantime, while he is transforming, it's difficult. It's so worth it. You know, the, what, what I heard in your story that I thought was so interesting is what God had already been working in Jason's heart. One of Jason's greatest giftings is his ability to shepherd people and care for people. And I don't know if you remember back in the story where he's at Casa de Boleyn and he hears someone weeping. He goes in to try and console. He just has nothing to offer. Let me tell you how great it is that the very heartbeat that God placed in Jason before Jason knew who Jesus was, was already working something in him where he was practicing for being a pastor. Now you have the truth to go with it, though, yeah. and that changes everything. We're going to release to our campuses in South Umquan Green. We love you guys, and um, as you guys take this on, we've got a couple questions for you. We're going to ask you, we actually, there's one challenge that's on your, uh, on your outline, and then uh, as we've been talking, Jason had a second one that he wanted you to kind of lean into. So the first one is we want you to connect with someone that doesn't know Jesus this week. Now that may mean that you're going to have to listen to something that's not normal for you. It means you may have to try something that you don't normally do. You may have to puzzle. You may have to Wikipedia some football. You'll be all right. 
We want you to connect with someone that doesn't know Jesus. And Jason had a second challenge. We want you to write this in. Yeah, so on that point of am I being transformed by the gospel, um, maybe there's something right now that you know this needs to change. Or maybe you're like, I, I don't really know. I want to encourage you guys. Ask God where he wants to change you this week. Awesome. You know what I love about that part is that God is never done changing us, mm -hmm. which means it's not just for the drug addict to move to sobriety. It's for the arrogant and the religious to move to humility and to move towards relationship. So he's got something in it for all of us. Mm -hmm. um, you want to pray for us just on those yeah. two points? Absolutely. Jesus, thank you so much that you looked at the cross and said it's worth it. I pray, God, for the conversations that we'll have with people who don't know you this week, that you would give them, give us, uh, firstly, give us your words, God. I pray that our actions and our words would be yours. They would be filled with grace and truth. And uh, I pray that you'd give those that we meet with ears to hear and eyes to see you. Uh, be in those conversations, God. And, and God, all of us here are broken. And there are areas in our lives that it, for every single one of us, you want to change. And so I ask you, God, that you would reveal to us this week what it is you want to change and give us the grace, give us the courage, the bravery to make those changes. Thank you so much, Jesus, that you persevered um, to the cross. In your name, amen. Amen. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. We hope that this was a challenging message for you where you stop and consider what the culture is around you and how you can engage it better. For those of you who live outside of the Douglas County area, there isn't a family church nearby that you can bring them to. Our encouragement would be that you would look at how you can engage their culture and point them towards Christ. And for those of you who do live in the Douglas County area, let me give you a challenge that you make sure that when you watch live stream, it's only when you're sick, but when you are feeling well that you're actually at a campus because then you have a place to bring people as you're engaging culture and as you're connecting with them then you have a, a community of people that surround you. Love you guys. If you have any questions, you can email us at info at familychurchweb.com.